As Gavin has mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about spasticity. I'm actually going to concentrate largely on spasticity. Um, I know people are very curious about famperdine, the walking drug, but the national commissioning body have come out with a blanket no. So I think at the moment it's probably not constructive to spend too much time on it. Okay? Um, so what I am going to talk about, even though this is all about research and what's new, I think when you think about spasticity, you know, we have to really think in the now as well, because for people who have spasticity, it tends to come at a time where people are having difficulty with walking or, you know, are getting a bit more disability and don't have years to wait for what's in the pipeline. So I'm going to concentrate a little, I'm going to talk a little bit about what's old um, and, you know, how we can use these, you know, older treatments in novel ways to maximise function and um, improve symptom control. I will then go through the kind of drug pipeline and other innovations that are um, coming through um, and then I'll finish with a video that hopefully um, you know I think is very impressive and a very positive way to to look at spasticity management so I know most of you are very expert um, about multiple sclerosis but for those who maybe haven't considered spasticity so much I just want to make sure that everybody understands what we're really talking about um, in simple terms, spasticity is what we call an exaggerated stretch response. So that when I want to move my arm, and I think about moving my arm, I relax this, my biceps muscle, contract the one here, and move my arm out. So I'm stretching this muscle, and my brain has to switch off that muscle to say that's okay. If my brain can't switch that off and it wants to you know, recoil, that's what spasticity is. It's, it's this loss of control um, of a muscle when it's stretched, so the muscles become overactive. It's very important to be clear about what this is because unless a doctor or a physiotherapist feels your legs, you might say, my legs are spasming, my legs, you know, I have stiffness. But actually, unless you move the legs and feel it, spasticity is very much what the other person feels in your legs. And sometimes it can be somebody has very heavy legs, very weak legs, and that's not spasticity at all, but they're taking medications that, you know, they maybe don't need or they're over-treated. And that's why I labor that point a little bit. It's very common in multiple sclerosis, but it's not a symptom exclusive to multiple sclerosis. It occurs in anybody who has a disease of the central nervous system. Anybody with a stroke can develop spasticity. Anybody with a spinal cord injury, all the people with cerebral palsy, a lot of those people have spasticity. So this is a symptom, um, and therefore all the treatments are, are more universal than disease specific. So actually, there's, a, you know, there's many more millions of people in the world who suffer with spasticity than just people with MS which is positive because obviously then the research group who are trying to tackle this problem is larger as well. Now, I put this up because not all spasticity is bad. Just because it's there, we don't treat it. We have to really assess the individual. What does this do in your, in, in your activities of daily living? What, what's it useful for? And what is it uh, causing problems with? And things like... Um, Things like mobility and transfers and how people feel about their body. Sometimes a little bit of stiffness, which keeps people walking, helps them transfer, keeps the legs moving, is actually a positive thing. Where it causes problems is when people say, well, you know, when I get up and try and walk, my foot sticks, um, I'm falling over, which puts them at risk. Um, it's interfering with relationships, sex, with bowel and bladder function. And this is when we really have to start treating it um, to improve quality of life. As I said, it is the mixture of the sensory input coming from muscles and the control from the brain. So anything in the body that is aggravating the sensory system can aggravate spasticity. So the first thing you always have to do is make sure all of these issues are addressed. I then say, you know, whatever stage of MS a person is at, exercise, stretching, physical activity is really, really important. The muscles and the joints can actually change if they're not moved regularly. So whatever it is, if you can exercise freely by yourself, great. If you need somebody to help um, to do some passive stretching, you know, that's what uh, needs to be done. And this up here is electrical stimulation, which isn't really necessarily a treatment for spasticity, but if somebody has just mild spasticity, it can overcome it and is a very useful tool. And electrical stimulation for the leg is very commonly used for foot drop and again can help with spasticity when people are walking. So not to forget these. These are the drugs that many of you know and I'm not going to go through them in most detail. But it's not all bad about the oral drugs. Everybody thinks about the future and what's new and um, actually when used properly um, and monitored um, these drugs can be very effective and most people have minimal side effects. 
When it becomes problematic is as spasticity worsens and people need higher doses and multiple drugs, then the side effects really creep in. Um, and as you can see, tiredness is a side effect of everything, you know, and this is one of the major problems with the oral drugs. It's also important to consider if, you, if, if a person has other problems, such as neuropathic pain or migraine or bladder problems, some of these drugs you should choose um, preferentially because it can be uh, one drug to treat two symptoms. So, a little bit about Botox. We all know about this problem with Botox, but actually, medicinally, it's used very effectively. And um, I don't do any cosmetic work, I just do the um, for spasticity. So, really, this is a picture of how we inject it. This is an upper limb of somebody who's had a stroke, in fact. And we use a little EMG machine to make sure we're in the right muscle, and we inject the, the botulinum toxin directly into the muscle. So what is Botox? Well, it's really a poison. I'm sure you've heard of botulism. Um, but we administer botulinum toxin in very small doses to give a very controlled paralysis or weakness of muscles. So it's only useful for limited areas because we're limited by dose. We don't want to kill anybody. And it's uh, probably more commonly used in MS in people who've got um, bladder overactivity, so a spastic bladder. And it's very important to know if you are going to get your wrinkles done. If you've had your bladder done, you have to tell them. So Sativex, this has now been licensed. Um, it's not widely available. Um, I know many of you are aware of the cannabis story and how so many people who've used cannabis, um, either smoking it or ingesting it for pain control um, or recreationally, but noticed that it made MS symptoms better, and particularly pain and spasticity better. And this is what led, has led a whole kind of pathway of research into cannabinoids or cannabis-type drugs. So this is what Sativex is. It is a cannabis spray. Um, it's delivered in such a way, and the makeup of it is to reduce any of the side effects that, you know, people getting high from it. Um, so whilst there are some effects in the brain in that way, they are uh, limited. So we can prescribe it at our clinic um, at the National Hospital. It's quite controlled how we, how we use it. It's only for people who have moderate to severe spasticity who are kind of going down the role of more invasive procedures such as intrathecal baclofen and will then use Sativex to see whether that can help control their symptoms. I do think it probably could be used earlier to good effect, but this is the limitation of the license that, um, they, that they have in this country anyway. So these figures are a little bit old and I do need to update them, but. Um, after 18 months of using it, we had 25 people uh, who had trialled Sativex at that time. Um, and in line with what's reported in the literature, um, we had 15 of the 25, so it's about 70% who responded to the drug uh, symptomatically. However, a few people over the following year uh, discontinued treatment due to you know, side effects or it wasn't controlling their spasticity properly. But it did mean that we had 10 people who stayed on the treatment for a year and didn't have to proceed to intrathecal baclofen at that time. So this is something we're now exploring and you know, we're gathering more data about this to, to uh, publish so that the license for Sativex, maybe it will be used to delay uh, use of intrathecal baclofen. The other area we want to look at is sleep that um, often people use clonazepam or baclofen at night to help sleep because of pain or spasms that um, disturb their sleep. And our question is whether taking a spray or several sprays of uh, Sativex going to bed at night would have the same effect but reduced side effects in the morning. So we're looking into um, designing a trial for this. So hopefully you'll hear more in the near future about that as well. So the drug pipeline. And as I said, people with spasticity they don't have 15 years to wait you know, for the wonder drug, and that's why I've spent so much time on what's there and what works when it's administered in the correct way. So basically, for every 10,000 drugs that are discovered, about one will pop out the other end. So it's a bit like in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, the bubblegum inventing machine that you know, clunks around for ages and then pop at the end, one little thing comes out. So this is the stage that um, compounds move into clinical trials, so people and initially our um, healthy volunteers are exposed to make sure that it's safe for humans. And then phase two trials, which are the first studies in people with a particular disease, moving on to the larger phase three, which is often what generates the licensing of a product if the outcomes are positive. And then it goes into a phase four, which is when it's available to people, but further information has been gathered. So where are we with all of this? 
So this is Sativex, which I've now told you about. So it's come out the other end. Um, limited use, but hopefully that market will grow. Um, these are now drugs that are all derivatives of baclofen, so either enteric um, release, so they're coated so that they release very slowly from the stomach, the dosing um, timing is lower, um, or else they're prolonged release tablets. Um, and these have all moved into phase three trials. Posterior tibial nerve stimulation. This is quite interesting. It's a bit like functional electrical stimulation, and but it's implanted. A little stimulator is put into the posterior tibial nerve, which is just in the leg, and um, the stimulation goes back up towards the spinal cord, and it's actually a use for overactive. Um, it's been licensed now, and NICE have approved it for um, overactive bladders. And what's been noticed in this population is that the lower limb spasticity also seems to improve. So this is licensed and available, but hasn't been studied directly for spasticity, and this is something we would also like to, to look into. Transcranial magnetic stimulation is what it says on the tin, that a magnetic field um, is, in, is you know, stimulating the brain directly to um, you know, have an effect on the inhibitory pathways to stop this overactive stretch response, and that's something that's also in trials. So now I'm going to move through the... Um, some of these other compounds, so oral cannabis, smoked cannabis, which I know a lot of this was discussed last year. Um, and I bring in the mouse doctor because Gavin's mentioned this compound, VSN16, which is really, it's a product of, of UCL, a uh, UCL business. So, um, uh, you know, the mouse doctor, Professor David Baker and colleagues have um, uh, designed this drug and it's now actually moving from the preclinical into the phase one studies. So this is something that's very exciting and hopefully if it gets through that we would like to um, have the phase two study at Queen Square, well at UCLP between the, all the sites. So it again could be something available to you. And these are then the, the cannabis type drugs that don't get you stoned as, as Gareth Price said last year. And if you haven't seen his talk it's still on YouTube from this day last year. And these are all, you know, moving from preclinical into clinical trials as well. So it's a healthy pipeline, but many of it's based on either cannabis or baclofen. So we have Sativex, we have baclofen. So I think, you know, we need to use what we have at the moment, knowing that hopefully better things are coming.